You're listening to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, John Wood Jr. Okay, outstanding. Folks, I'm very excited about the conversation that we're about to have here today. Uh, I am joined by a brother named Sho Baraka, who is a Christian hip hop artist, uh, a person who has a phenomenally, in my opinion, sort of enlightened and thought through perspective about issues ranging from race, religion, to politics, music, and the intersection uh, of these themes. But he's also a man who has uh, a story to tell, I think, which will shine a light on different aspects of the American experience. And we'll introduce folks who are not familiar uh, with him uh, to a mind and an artist who I think is setting a positive, positive example uh, for people in the country, um, in the church, and beyond. So uh, with no uh, further ado, uh, Sho Baraka, the author of He Saw That It Was Good. Did I get that right? You got it right, my friend. My name, pronunciation, and everything. So we're already on a good start. Excellent. Well, welcome to the podcast, man. <laughs> Thank you for having me, John. Appreciate uh, you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, man. So let's let's jump into it really quick because you've got a fascinating story and I want uh, I want people to to hear it. So um I introduced you as a Christian hip hop artist. You're a person who has a background in music, a background in the church, a person who I think has experienced sort of bridging divides in the context of the different parts of the church community. I imagine you've got real experience sort of interacting with the music industry in and out of the church. And there, I know that there are always stories to be told there. Um, take us back to the beginning. First of all, how would you describe yourself, you know, sort of as an artist yeah. and professional? Where does your story begin? So, you know, it's, it depends. It, I always, it, there's always this, this cringiness that happens when people introduce me as a Christian hip hop artist, because it's like, uh, there's, there's, it usually tends to be a, uh, a qualification that comes with that. People, well, he's not that good of an artist then. <laughs> and I think I'm up there with the best. So uh, yes, I would like to think that um, I am an artist who has, uh, you know, I, I recognize the consumer's label you and so you know it doesn't matter what you think you are if you think you're an rb singer and everybody calls you a pop artist they're going to put you in the pop category mm -hmm. and so i recognize that the type of music i make is uh saturated in deep religious thought um i've kind of gotten away from it being just purely didactic in its teaching it's now it, it tends to be a little bit more socially conscious political but yet and still my solutions are usually always something that's saturated in religion so Christian artist, I get it. I understand it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to down that hill. Um, but Let me I, just uh, say for folks who doubt though, I have listened uh, to uh, some of <laughs> shows music. Uh, this man is the real deal. There's no asterisk uh, next to artist. Uh, thank you. Show Baraka, but thank you. Continue. And that's all I wanted to hear is that's all I want to hear, John, is that <laughs> this is not junior varsity ball we're playing right now. <laughs> uh, um, so anyway, I think you asked me what uh, kind of like my story, like uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I grew up in Southern California, similar to you, um, uh, more of the Inland Empire area, San Bernardino County, Riverside County areas, did spend some time in Inglewood. Uh, Los Angeles area's parents, our Los Angeles area parents went to Crenshaw High School, met. They were uh, part of the Black Panther Party. My father played uh, high school ball at Crenshaw, ended up going to play Oregon, um, played at San Diego State as well, got drafted, ended up going to Canada, late, left Canada where I was born, played for the New Orleans Saints. So this is all kind of important. Right. Um, and my mom always was kind of like, involved in activist work, but never really had a job. Uh, she always felt like, or a career better yet, sorry. She never really had a career because she's always felt like, well, I'm gonna be married to this man forever. We're gonna have a wonderful family. He'll take care of me, et cetera, et cetera. Well, after my father football career, others football career ended, my parents split. And so um, moved back to the, you know, Los Angeles, outside Los Angeles area. And uh, my father just kind of disappeared. And so here you go. This, this child who kind of grew up in privilege and wealth at one point in time, now having to grow up um, in some of the more uh, desolate parts of, or blighted parts of, of Southern California, hmm. introduced to gangs and, you know, just other types of activities that come around, uh, that orbit around those particular types of communities. And um, 
but <clears throat> my mother always informed us or kind of tried her best to just shape us with black literature, um, you know, the Harlem Renaissance, you know, <laughs> I remember in the seventh grade, my mom made me do a, for one of my project progress reports uh, or book projects, the uh, autobiography of Malcolm X by Alex Haley. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine kind of like the indelible impact that these kinds of this, this kind of work has on an individual. So anyway, I just want to fast forward a little bit, get to high school. My father comes back into my life or whatever. He's a Christian. So he um, disappears, but he comes back this deeply religious man and is trying to redeem the time he lost. Um, and so that, life that he lived impacted my brother and I. And so uh, here you have this dude my, and myself who grew up reading Harlem Renaissance, grew up reading black literature, but now is being impacted by this faith that my father and my brother and I have. I've always wanted to go to a black or HBCU. So I ended up going to Tuskegee University. And there is kind of like where I had this, some people would say come to Jesus moment, but it was more than just Jesus. It was like, I had this reckoning of wh who am I? Like, Faith, why? What, is, what does faith mean to me? What does being black mean to me? What is, what is vocation and calling and what do I want to do with my life? And how am I here just to make money? Am I here just to be famous? Am I here just to make, like, to, to be a ladies man? Like, who am I? And, and, and around that year, it was a two year period where I think I was wrestling with all the narratives that were given to me. And uh, I think it, it I kind of came out of that, this, this individual who loved Jesus, who was trying to figure out how to love his black skin and black identity while at the same time wanted to be useful for the world. And so honestly, man, I just been on that trajectory ever since I've stumbled, I've failed. Um, I've done excellent. Um, I've made music. I've been in films. I've created all types of content and cultural products that I think have made the world a little better. Some people will say probably not, <laughs> but, um, Many I people think, would say the opposite. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I think I'm here. I just, I think if, if just to give you kind of like a general um, uh, Cliff Notes version of my life, I think I am an individual who has been trying to figure out how to reconcile um, what does it mean to be a black man in America um, while also submitting that unto, under this religious idea of love your neighbor, love God and do good works. Mm. So let's pick up um, right there on that thread then. Do you feel and, and do you observe in perhaps uh, other, um, other Black Christians, maybe of your, your generation um, or, or, um, or older, doesn't have to be just of your generation, but do you observe there being something of a tension, certainly in today's context, maybe historically uh, as well, between this idea that on the one hand, as believers, we are meant to love our neighbors as we love ourselves and that there is no partiality in God. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, at least for so many African-Americans, there's cultural significance to being Black and a historical uh, and perhaps even contemporaneous struggle, which calls for there being some solidarity uh, in the face of, of perceived and real challenges that may face the black community that in some cases push some black folks to, to say like, you know, Hey, look, I'm, I'm about black folks. I'm not worried too much about white people's feelings on this front or the other. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how would you describe that, uh, that tension um, for a believer such as yourself? I think you described it perfectly. I think your question is the answer. You're the same thing you just said, you can take that and I can just say that is the answer. Okay. There has been, uh, you know, I am, I am, I try to be as honest and also nuanced as possible when I look at not only the arc of history within this country, but just in general human exchange and human interaction across different continents and countries, because I recognize, you know, left up to our own devices, we will do uncalculable harm. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, this is the reason why I find religion to be something that is useful, the great, a great utility, because it teaches me that it's not about my own self-interest, it's about the benefit of other people and to, you know, love God, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, um, when I look at the history of Christianity in this country, it doesn't, it, it has its gold and it has its shadow. Mm -hmm. And so we can talk about some of the gold, obviously, you know, there's been great teachings, there's been great um, trans 
transmission of these principles into culture where people create great uh, ethics and principles and it teaches us to work hard and uh, and to you know do good and et cetera. But there's also the shadow in that uh, oftentimes our, our cultural product and our cultural progress has trailblazed over people. Mm-hmm. And, and we've yet to, I think, in an honest way, deal with that. And for instance, you'll have seminaries and you'll have institutions that ha- are, you know, have these huge endowments because of the types of free labor that they had or the, 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 the way that these particular institutions have been built. And, you know, you have some of these institutions re- coming into a reckoning with like, you know, SBC and, you know, the PCA or just other organizations uh, that have uh, made public declarations and trying to figure out what does it mean for us to uh, repair and apologize. And I think what's happening is, is there are a lot of minority or more specifically black Christians who are fatigued with the pace in which things are going to be repaired. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there can be a lot of deconstructing that's happening. A lot of folks, which is common today, say, oh, I want to, I am deconstructing or I am decolonizing my faith and I am trying to get back to just the root of Jesus. And I think that's good, but there's also the reality you have to deconstruct to something. Like you have to have vision. You can't just have anti-vision. You can't just tear things down without having a vision of what you want to build. And I think there are some people who are just so excited about just tearing down, removing and not looking towards something. If I can just be a little pretentious real quick and and turn it to a pastor. Um, If we think about, (laughs) we think about, uh, um, and I'll try not to act like as if everybody who's listening knows the Bible story, but you know, when we look at Egypt and how the Israelites exited Egypt, the one thing that God wanted for Moses to do is to go and set the people free. The Israelites were captive under the the uh, the authority of the Egyptian kingdom and Pharaoh. And so the first thing God does is send a leader. He sends a leader to one, bring liberation. And with that liberation um, is not only just a physical removal of slavery, but also like a psychological liberation as well. But then he also gives them law. It's not, I don't wanna just lead you guys out of something and, li- and leave you to licentiousness and lawlessness. There needs to be order and structure. And so from that, um, he also says, I'm going to send you to a particular land. I don't want you just to be wandering in the desert because liberation is, is kind of faux or, or pseudo unless you have a place that you can reside and, and dig roots into. Mm-hmm. But after you do this, after you get this kind of like leadership, liberation, law, land, hopefully there's legacy that you can pass this down to your children and your children's children. And I think what's happening is, is that Many black folks in this country, and not just Christians, but many black folks in this country are trying to figure out that that those tenets. It's like, what does it mean to have, who are our leaders? What does it mean to be liberated in this country? What, what kind of laws do we have to live by? What should we live by? Not just civil law, but like business. Like, how do we do business? What are, what are the best ways to do business with one another? What are the best ways to interact with one another relationally? And then we move to like, where do we do this? Is there a place that we can actually express ourselves, not just physical land um, in a sense of like where you build homes, but like actual institutions. Are there institutions that we can trust so that we can not just be at the table, but we can actually pick the groceries and cook ourselves, you know what I mean? Um, and then like, is there a legacy that we can pass on? And I say that there are a lot of movements in history that have done part of those, that have done a lot of that. They've, they've Leaders have come, they've given some sense of liberation, they've given us new ways to think about things, but there's yet to be real land and real legacy that's been passed on in some instances. And in my book, I, I kind of talk about the failings of the Harlem Renaissance and the civil rights movement in some of those aspects um, through the help of other academics that I've read. It's just not my own personal assessment. but mm-hmm. Right. Well, here's, um, here's a, uh, a question. Um, my sense is that folks will perceive their, and you know, we've already sort of touched on it, but you know, this, this, this tension between the idea of racial solidarity, but also kind of a universal sort of mm-hmm. um, coming together of God's people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Dr. King said that the most segregated hour in America is 11 o'clock, 11 a.m. 
on mm -hmm. Sunday morning. But King also said that in the uh, in, in in the organizing uh, in in Birmingham and on the front lines of the civil rights civil rights movement. Uh, that they accomplished what the church had failed to accomplish uh, on Sunday morning by bringing people from across Absolutely. the spectrum of, of Christian faith and beyond white and black um, together in order to advocate for a more just society for the beloved community. So my question is, is it, are we missing something as believers, white or black, if we don't have a conscious sort of vision mm. of social progress for this country that kind of actively includes this coalition across colors, even yes. if it doesn't, doesn't have to come at the expense of a, a consciousness of the, of the black struggle, let's say. So I think it's, I think it's both and, I, and this is you know, personally, I don't think that, I think a progress that is, tied to black consciousness and, and, and particular communities is also beneficial for the greater country as well. Mm -hmm. However, I do think um, a lot of the problems that we think in the black community, we often try to tie to racial animus, which may not just be purely racial animus. Mm -hmm. um, there are greater problems uh, at play that affect all people. Mm -hmm. and. You know, there are problems that affect people in the community in which I live in Atlanta that, uh, the same way that they affect folks in the Appalachian. And uh, this is the beauty of many folks who've come before us like King and like a Fred Hampton or, you know, folks who recognize that there is a similar struggle amongst people. And some of us think it's 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 and I think this is what you're asking me. Hopefully I'm, I'm on the right track. Um, that there, sin, there tends to be um, movements who think it's exclusively a black issue. When I don't think every issue is exclusively a black issue, nor is it, nor should we try to solve those problems with, um, with racial answers, if you will. Mm. Um, but there are things that I think have intentionally target particular communities and until those particular communities deal with it, not only on the micro and the macro, the internal and external, I think America as a country will fare to progress. It's very similar to a family. If um, if, if me as a the sibling and the child of two parents, if if I'm not healthy, my, my brothers and my family may be healthy, but in reality, my unhealth affects the household. And so America as a whole needs to consider the whole household. And I think there's been times when people progress and not just white people, but any race of people, when they progress, they tend to say, well, I am progressing. I am flourishing. Um, I don't really, I don't really concern myself. Now here's where I talk at somewhat of the side of my neck. And I don't think it's, I think it's just nuance is that there are going to be disparities and there's going to be gaps. I mean, there's no way that we can live in any society where all things um, are equal. Yeah. I live, I have two kids who are on the autism spectrum. I have two boys who are on the autism spectrum. And I recognize that there's no way I'm gonna live in a world where everybody considers my children and everywhere we go. It's just, mm -hmm. I can't. However, we try to create, um, a sensitivity for people to recognize like, oh, well, let's try to make the world a little better for them. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are things that they just won't be able to accomplish. And there are particular institutions or places and businesses we'll go to that just won't consider them. And I have to understand that. And so in the same sense, um, what does it look like to close the disparities a little bit for people who are, who've been historically marginalized while at the same sense, thinking about America as a whole, and that's maybe some of the policies that affect everybody um, maybe affect particular groups even more. And how do we, how do we reckon that? Mm. Um, and that's kind of like to your, to your, to your point, I think we're on the same page or I think I'm answering is like, I think there's a lot of my concern that is dealing with hum humanity. Um, I'm not trying to leave my white brothers and sisters out of the conversation because I think it's imperative. And especially when you think about the pains and the ills of racism, it doesn't just impact the, the victim. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it creates a, a distortion of the person who harbors that, 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 that racism because they, th they have a higher view of themselves. And to get you know, biblical again, this is the problem where, as Jesus talks about, like, don't think of yourself more hardly than you ought to. And I think slavery, 
uh, did that. And I think race and the legacy of that, and historically, those folks who still have that type of mindset allow themselves to look at uh, other people greater than they ought to. But I also feel that that's grown over into uh, economic status is that just as much as I think we have a race issue, we have a great economic disparity in our, in our country. And we have to figure out how not to just, um, how greed and avarice has become a God that is tearing out the fabric of our country away. And oftentimes we just wanna win. And I do think a great lesson from scriptures is that sometimes winning is dying on the cross. As mm. Jesus did. So part of what really interests me is what is the obligation of a Christian then when it comes to engaging folks who may see the world very differently than Amen. do you, right? And so, I mean, just, just for example, great. Yeah. right, right. I mean, you're going to have people listening to this podcast right now uh, who I think will be uh, some, some folks uh, who will be of the opinion and you know, white and black, uh, that uh, you know, look, racism is an overblown problem in modern American society, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, you know, feel like if you take advantage of the opportunities that you have in life, yes, you're going to have individual races here and there, but you can make of yourself as much as you put into life, so on and so forth. You have folks who have a different social analogy than you, but you know, many of those folks are going to be folks who say, "Hey, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer." If I see you, you know, with the flat tire on the side of the road, I'm going to pull over and help mm -hmm. you out just out of common decency and so forth. So forth. Um, is it is it um, is it at all um, an inconsistency uh, to engage with folks who fall outside of your own sort of, you know, p political perspective in the kinds of interactions that might open minds, or is that actually, you know, close to the heart of the point of the commission that, that Christ gives us, that we'd be willing to sort of go into those conversations? Because I've definitely engaged with folks, even some folks who would identify themselves as believers who say that I draw a line at having certain conversations, right? Mm -hmm. But it, you know, um, but then there's this other approach, which says, lean in. Yeah. So I'm wondering how you approach it. I think it's a great question. I, um, to get extreme, uh, this, this, you know what, I think, I think different scenarios calls for different approaches. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, I do think that for me, my theology, and here's, you know, the, the trouble of, of, uh, of trying to make this apply personally without giving a greater challenge. I just know for me personally, um, I don't have the luxury to not be an agent of reconciliation. I don't believe that's, I just don't believe that's the, the call of the Christian. Um, so in any, in any scenario, I am trying my best to figure out how do I hold to my convictions while at the same time having a very humble posture and disposition and not believing that everything that I hold to is absolutely right. Mm -hmm. and, and then even when I'm angry about something, like I can have this conversation with a black person or a white person who feels like racism is overblown. How do I sit and, and think critically? Like, well, let me listen to them. And you know what, honestly, just to bring you um, a real personal antidote, I, um, during, during the summer of 2020, I was quite furious and, and frustrated with all of the, 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 the you know, the, the, the police killings and the, the acts of violence. I was just like, this is enough is enough. And I remember I had a black friend who is, you know, I guess you can say more conservative than, than I am, mm -hmm. uh, who challenged me to read particular people and listen to particular people. And not to say that you're conservative, but that's actually how I kind of discovered you and on the Dark Horse part podcast with, you know, with the John McWhorters and the Glenn Lowry's, although I, I was familiar with many of those folks before, um, watching that podcast uh, gave me a posture of listening. It taught me how to listen to people because it was the first time I had heard a, a, an intelligent articulation of uh, against reparations from, mm. I think it was um, Camille and- uh, Glenn, Glenn Lowry, probably. Yeah. yeah, and I was like, this is fascinating to me. I was like, this is quite fascinating because it wasn't, oh, and Coleman, and Coleman also as well. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is fascinating because I'm, I'm, I'm the type of person who wants to, to, to try to um, operate outside of a bubble. And so at the end of the day, I think Henry Nouwen 
famed theologian, Catholic theologian, has a statement that hospitality is not a, is not forcing change to happen, but it's creating a space where where change can possibly happen. And I think I just try to move with that. It's like, well, I'll have conversations with people who have differing views. When I read a book on policing, I try to read an opposing thought. Mm. When I read a book on race, uh, like I read a ta Coates, well, now I'm going to read a Barbara Fields, Racecraft. Mm. You know mm. what I'm saying? Like, I want to make sure that I'm hearing various perspectives on, on how people are viewing this from an academic posture, because I recognize that I may be um, deficient in a particular posture. And so for me, at the end of the day, my goal is ultimately reconciliation without this posture of lording politically, lording uh, ethically and morally over people. I can't force people to think the way that I think. I can't force people to even act the way I act. Um, I can't stop people from murdering, but I can get on a platform and I can try to reason with people and say, hey, here's the reason why I don't think we should murder. Here's the reason why I don't think abortion is good. Here's the reason why I don't think policing uh, should be uh, should operate in the way that it, 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 it operates. However, we live in a democracy, which I think is wonderful and the people make decisions. And when I lose, I, I try to lose well, <laughs> while at the same time thinking about eternity, thinking about the souls of individuals and how can I still be a, a healthy contributor to the, to the greater needs and demands of humanity while at the same time being a minority on, uh, with not religious minority, but maybe a political and social minority in the views that I hold. Mm. So I don't know if that helps in any way. No, no, are you kidding? No, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's incredibly uh, rich and relevant. And um, it's, it's, I think, always commendable to, to meet somebody who goes out of their way to invite different perspectives, consume knowledge from different points of view, and then to apply that to the actual work of human connection. I mean, really, that that's that is our culture here at Braver Angels to, mm -hmm. to say that you know everybody is starting where they're starting, everybody's coming from where they're coming from, and are welcome at the table. But once we get here, let's familiarize ourselves with one another's points of view, seek out the best representations mm -hmm. of some of the opinions on offer and try to apply that to our ability to build goodwill and collaboration uh, yeah. together. So yeah, I, I honor the spirit within which you're talking. Don't Thank mind you. you referring to me as a conservative, by the way. Um, I'm a, you know, I'm a person who does think of himself as conservative, but I also, you know, I, I try to think for myself, uh, Mm -hmm. And to learn consistently in 360 degrees, and you know, right. my opinions have have never stopped uh, progressing and evolving. You know, yeah. Um, I just don't want to like to. I don't like to mischaracterize people. I, I you know, because very similar to my the opening, where it's like I don't like being called a particular thing, but if people call me it, I'm not going to sit there and argue them down. So I just wanted to make yeah. sure that you know. No, I, I understand that. Um, yeah. I understand that entirely because so much is lost in translation with the label. Absolutely. And if and if all you are is the label. Then that's right. unfortunate, right? Because, right. because, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no. Do you, do you, go, go ahead. I think you're going to make a wonderful point if all you are on the label. No, well, I mean, that's all I was really going to. Oh, okay. I was really going to say about it. Yeah, yeah. Because no, yeah, no. I just, I just, I, I find that, um, especially. So, you know, you asked the question about some of the tension that minority Christians are, are facing, like the the term evangelical, for instance. Um, you, it's it's it is it is a it is filthy rags. It is a stain to be considered. Uh, evangelical in certain spaces that are, you know, that are not predominantly white Trump voting spaces. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I just don't feel like I am going to allow that term to be hijacked. Mm -hmm. Like I believe historically it means something totally different than what it means today. And for people to abandon not only just terms, but the faith altogether to me is this is it's so disheartening because um, it just feels like we, we, we it just feels um, I don't know, cheap is the best, lazy. It feels like, and even to your point, like conservative, I know I have some conservative views. I yeah. uh, also know I have some very liberal views. Um, and when people call me things, I can, I can feel what they mean by it. Because <laughs> sometimes it's a pejorative and I'm like, Let, explain to me why you feel that way about me. Um, so anyway, I guess I remember when I was a young when I was a young boy, my mother, uh, or my uh, uncle, voted for the first George W. Uh, or first the first George Bush, and uh, and everybody else in my family voted for Bill Clinton, 
And I just remember everybody in our family hating my uncle, just mm. hating him for at least a good year. It was just like, oh, I can't believe you voted for him. And I'm so young. I have no idea why everybody hates him. And I, the only thing I could deduce was, oh, well, he's a conservative. He's a Republican. And Black people don't like conservatives and Republicans. And so this, this stuck with me forever. And so to some degree, you still have that stain and that narrative in our, in our communities. And so, you know, you get the, the, the ad hominems and the epitaphs, the coons, the, you know, Uncle Tom's. And it's just, it's so unfortunate because I don't think we've allowed ourselves to think critically about the ideologies on its own, attached, mm -hmm. detached from the party, even though I think association means a lot. But mm -hmm. what does it mean to believe and to hold tightly to an ideology or an idea divorce from maybe the people who espouse it. And don't get me wrong, I think the people who espouse it and sometimes the people who, the messenger has a lot, it has to, we have to consider that. So anyway, I just went on my little old uh, conservative tangent, oops. No, 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 that's a very valuable point and I appreciate it because it does seem to me like, well, first of all, you, you know, you, you're not the first person to Basically, I mean, you pointed this out in yourself, but many people, including many Democrats, and I can say this as somebody who ran for office as a Republican in South Central LA, but you know, many Democrats, Black Democrats would say to me, oh yeah, I've got all sorts of conservative opinions, so on and so forth. I have a distrust of the Republican Party and the people yeah. that I think are pushing it in uh, you know, uh, a racist direction. I mean, this is what folks right. say to me in the community. But I think that the deeper principle that you're highlighting is just the fact that we ought not let the stigma, the stigmatization of labels get in the way of us being honest about the substance of what we actually believe, because that prevents That's us good. from A, being able to learn from each other, and B, being able to connect with each other as human beings, right? That's what uh, I was trying to say. You said it in way more eloquent way than I could. Oh, you, you, just, you just set me up for it. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> you just set me up for it. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, in turn, set myself up for this segue, which uh -oh. is speaking of things that allow us to connect with each other uh, and relate to each other as human beings, I think that music has a particular power in Absolutely. culture. Absolutely. Right? So that's the segue right there. there uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, I think, I think you know, you, you know uh, a little bit about me, I think, and that I, you yeah. know, I come from a musical background myself. My, my father raised me telling me that, you know, good music drove the civil rights movement. And so Absolutely. That, Absolutely. That was, yeah, that there was the greatness of American popular culture, you know, back in the day that made the country great. Now for my dad, all this began to go downhill, you know, starting in the seventies and, and so forth. Um, my father is white, but you got a lot of folks, white and black of my dad's generation who would say that hip hop is just very damaging uh, to American culture and society and so forth. I mean, I was deeply raised in that uh, yeah. kind of point of view on the impact, the cultural effect of hip hop, which yeah. is ironic because on my mother's side of the family, uh, one of my uh, uncles is a uh, Mac 10 of the West Side Connection. Oh, he, uh, Mac 10. All, all about, yeah, right, right. <laughs> and, and he and my dad got along, got along great. Um, but um, so uh, I would have, a, I would be curious to ask you about, um, about the power of music, the impact of hip hop uh, in, in general. Do you, do you look at hip hop in, in ways that, you know, do, do you look at the whole arc of hip hop as being, so do you think that folks basically are totally out to lunch when they have criticisms of the culture of hip hop or do you see some kernels of truth in some of oh, that? Yeah. And um, what has your experience been like as somebody who is taking this medium of hip hop, which a lot of folks, you know, have certain associations with and, and bringing that authentically to the substance of the gospel or the substance of the gospel to hip hop and so mm -hmm. forth and sort of crafting kind of your own, you know, powerful um, artistic message through that. So, um, so yeah. yeah. So John, one of the things you're gonna learn about me is I hardly live on the extremes of anything. Um, <laughs> uh, the only extremes I live on is that, you know, the Lakers are the greatest basketball team to ever, <laughs> of course, uh, oh. you know, w w walk on the planet, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. But right. for the most part, I don't live in extremes. And so I, I like to think, you know, deeply about stuff, but also the trouble I get into is that people think that I'm just a contrarian sometimes or, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera, et cetera. I so <laughs> there's a, I think you can do with hip hop, what you can do with any general, like any cultural product. 
it's funny, like jazz was viewed the same way. It was viewed as, you know, hypersexual. Even Du Bois wrote about <laughs> uh, how jazz was pointless and how it was a waste of time. It was low art and low culture and how black folks mm -hmm. were, were wasting their time engaging in this form of art. And think about that, like Du Bois, W.E. Right. Du Bois is shaming <laughs> jazz <laughs> music. Anti-jazz, right. It's anti-jazz. We would right. never think that, right? Right, it's true, it's true, you're right. So, I mean, there's there's, there's no movement, there's no cultural product, film, I don't know, I, that can that can, that can be put up to the, to, you know, put on trial and, and walk away unscathed without some sort of honest critique and criticism. So yes, hip hop has its, feral, its, its, its frailties, it has its detriment in a lot of ways. I think the very gold of it, that it speaks to culture in a very demonstrative, authoritative way, also is its shadow in that it's very provocative about violence, misogyny, homophobia, just all these things, right? Just, it just, sh it, and it also can inform people as it's gold, right? It informs people politically. Think about the, um, the, the public enemies and the message and uh, the Karis ones and the Fugees and all these groups who were politically conscious and informing like you, you think about um, there are young black kids who learned more about religion and politics listening to some of these artists than they ever did in classrooms or from the mm -hmm. news because they felt like here are these cultural representatives who are talking to me in my language, who I feel like I trust, who I feel care about me and they're teaching me things. But in the same sense, you know, um, it has an influence to, you know, promote violence. It has the influence to promote all types of things that may not be helpful because people take in hip music in general, they take in messages and no matter how powerful or strong you are, like it, it does something to you. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if it was Brene Brown, Brene Brown, it, it, it may have been her, but she had a, a TED talk. I think she was talking about how to give people confidence. She said she, I think she said she listens to 50 Cent before, like, <laughs> because the audacity of 50 Cent, you know, gives just before you walk into a meeting where you're nervous, it's just like, I dare somebody say something crazy to me if it is me. Right. <laughs> I was just listening to 50 Cent 10 minutes ago. <laughs> in a certain frame of mind. Yeah. Exactly. So, so yes, there's a goal. Um, but you can't deny what hip hop has done to build, I'll make an argument for its literary, literary devices and how it's made people understand literary, uh, lit literature, writing, and just comprehension better. Mm -hmm. I mean, teaching people analogies, metaphors, double entendres, similes, like all these different things, hip hop does that, right? Mm -hmm. um, communication skills, but you gotta think about jobs that it's created. You know, it's giving people the opportunity to build empires. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, but also it's just a great way of transmitting cultural ideas. You learned about, when I was a young boy, I don't know if you, you, you're younger than me, but I don't know if you, DJ Quick had a song called Just Like Compton. And it was <laughs> uh, his way of <laughs> broadcasting about other neighborhoods across the country. And so just like a good book does, it either, it can, like a good book can help you time travel. It can it takes you to different places that you've never been and you learn about these places through books. Right. Hip hop and DJ Quick did that. Like he was teaching me about Denver. He was teaching me about Houston. He was, and he was like, it's just like Compton in this way. And I'm like, wow, I never knew. Like, I didn't know Denver. I didn't know Arkansas was like that. I thought everybody in Arkansas was just rocking around with cowboy hats. You know what I'm saying? It's like, but no, there's people in this. So hip hop has this way of transmitting ideas and, and uh, sensibilities that I think are really, really, powerful and probably more advantageous than other forms of modalities of art because of the density right. of its work. And right. so um, I think hip hop is a tool that a lot of people thought was just gonna be a fad and it was gonna come and go. But I think also as the artist and the gatekeepers of hip hop mature, the art form will mature as well. And mm -hmm. so now you have artists who are in their 30s, 40s and 50s like Jay-Z who are writing music about financial literacy, who are writing albums and songs about, about raising kids. Um, and so it's not just about parties. It's just not about, you know, having a good time. It's, it's just not about um, politics or, you know, it's like, it's 
these are, you think about it and somebody's made songs about these things. Mm -hmm. And so as the artist matures, as the, as the gatekeepers in the execs mature and as the listeners, cause you to think like, think about it. It started in, in the seventies and it's, it's not even 50 years old yet as a, as a cultural product. Right. And so now you'll have people mature. The audience is mature and you'll get more content that I think, just like jazz, just like blues, just like gospel, that that is, I guess you can say, uh, relevant to the zeitgeist. Right, right. By the way, I don't remember that DJ Quick song. I remember DJ Quick, of course. I do remember uh, uh, loving a song uh, by uh, Nappy Roots called "The Whole Damn World's Country." Yeah, you, which had a similar sort of <laughs> similar sort of function, right? Yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Um, we but I was just going to say, I mean, speaking of the maturing of the art and the artists and the audience and so forth, um, how, how does that wind up intersecting with um, with with the church and, you know, mm. with the with the world of, you know, the black church in particular and gospel music and so on and so forth? Uh, because, you know, I it just occurred to me, I mean, when I was younger, you know, I remember listening to Kirk Franklin. I remember Kirk Franklin Kirk Franklin dropping the the New Nation project. I mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. it was. And yeah, that it was. was uh, that was a big hit. But you know, outside of him, I I don't think that mainstream America uh, and many black folks, it, well, and most black folks at least, at least at that time prior to him, were necessarily associating you know hip hop and and gospel music, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the story behind that? And was there a cultural tension or clash that took place? within the church that mm -hmm. accompanied that story? Yeah, yeah, so I think the same tension, you know, your father had, my, my father, my church, many people had, black, white, whatever, is that um, hip hop. <laughs> I mean, first, you gotta think about it like this. The church has always been, in the Western church, especially within America, is, is, is always a couple, movements behind mm -hmm. when it comes to what cultural engagement should look like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's still movements that think Disney is the devil. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I don't know, maybe Disney is not the best for our kids <laughs> or whatnot, but I'm like, if don't you tell can't, my kids that. <laughs> exactly. If you can't appreciate Moana and like, you know, I don't know, like, Princess and the Frog. I don't know what to tell you. Like it's just, I, you know. So there's 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 always this lagging for the sense of trying to create a, a secular sacred divide. And I think oftentimes you've had churches that have kept that divide because they've seen hip hop as this licentious, very um, vile, flagrant kind of art form. And so the problem is, is that those folks who don't see the world as sacred and secular, but sees everything as sacred and sees everything as being under the auspices of God. Mm -hmm. But we pervert things, have had little opportunity to do work in churches because the church has had a hard line of saying, nope, this is what's sacred and this is what's sac uh, secular. And so what we see now is that there are some, you know, some, some tearing down of the walls. And I think Kirk was a huge advocate in that with the, you know, uh, are you ready for a revolution? Woo, woo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Having even like salt and pepper or, or you know, salt uh, rap on um, stomp song. And so it kind of eased folks into it. But I think what's happened now, even though there's still not this unified uh, or unanimous acceptance of Christian hip hop, which is a subgenre of a subgenre and is even younger than hip hop. So itself. So now you're thinking about, look at this. Christian movement that's trying to redeem what they've seen as foul and say, no, like we're doing this art form, but we're doing it for, you know, Jesus, if you will, or we're doing it from a posture of communicating this through this Christian lens is still, is still being viewed as, well, we're not sure if this is safe. And gospel music was the same thing. I mean, it was just an, uh, you know, hymns and spirituals were the things. And then you, you know, the Jubilee singers started going on tour and, and they started to revise it from that. And eventually you get into gospel music and even like the Thomas Dorsey's and the folks would look at them and be like, I don't know if this is all the way good for us. It sounds too much like the blues, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it just takes time to progress. But I do, I do think there's been great intersection in the sense that folks like myself, the folks like Lecrae, the folks who, who have pretty big platforms who use hip hop as a way to communicate, it's, it's, it's basically you have this metropolis and you have this place where everybody is coming to share their thoughts. It's like the, it's like the Greek or Roman Colosseum and people are coming to say, hey, here's my thought of the day. Here's my thought. No, I want to share this thought. It's the Greeks coming together to philosophize. Here. And now what you have are these Christians who rap coming to the space and say, hey, you've all looked at Christianity as either being lame, being legalistic, are being those folks who didn't see usefulness in the things that you love. What we're doing is we're taking that and we're redeeming that and we're repackaging it in a way that's saying you who you are is, is good, like good enough. You don't have to change the way you dress. You don't have to change your name. You don't have to stop speaking in the, in the, in the colloquials you speak in, but God cares about the heart and he cares about the, the inside. And so what we're doing is now we're still using all the... <laughs> The, the veneer of the culture and not just using it just for to proselytize, but because we are from the culture, we are people of the culture. And we're saying here, we're repackaging this message as missionaries do when they go to other countries. If you go to another country as a missionary, you learn Japanese, you understand the culture, you, you ingrain yourself in the culture in the same, in the same sense, it's like we are of hip hop culture and we just had a heart change that directed our affections toward Jesus. And now we're trying to communicate from our worldview. Because here's the thing, every rapper is preaching something. They're all communicating a worldview. The problem is, is that we just get labeled Christians because it's, it's <laughs> we get labeled Christian hip hop when, you know, Lupe and uh, Jay Electronica, they don't get considered Muslim hip hop, right. you know? Yeah. Wu-Tang and Erica Badu wasn't considered 5% music. It was just music. Um, and in the same sense, we want to be labeled as music, but I do recognize the, you know, the tensions and the labeling, however, because Christian markets were created so that they didn't have to worry about the secularizing of their children. Right. And so they had their own brick and mortar spaces. They had their own festivals. They had their own touring agencies. And so to our detriment, we started off in that way, uh, not detriment. Let me, let me not be too harsh. We started off in that way. And, and then we realized the limitations in going just through their festivals, just through their brick and mortar spaces and just through their distrib distribution agencies. And we said, no, wait, we need to engage the world because right now we're just speaking to the choir and even the choir sometimes, they don't even really love us. They want to just use us to babysit their kids. <laughs> and so there was a repositioning of what is, how can we use hip hop as a way that is authentic to the culture? It doesn't seem like we're culture vultures because we're not, but also, is honest and authentic to the gospel. So we're not sacrificing our culture, but we're also submitting it unto the Lord. Mm, indeed. I feel bad because I would love to pursue that particular topic and we're towards the end of our time. And I'm gonna throw in a wild card here that we yeah, <laughs> may not yeah. be able to entirely do justice, but we've talked about race, religion, politics, music, and uh, uh, hip hop and, 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 and the church in, in particular. Um, how would you uh, how would you explain the significance and the impact of Kanye West, particularly the, the latest kind of episode of Kanye, where Kanye West winds up sort of, you know, waltzing into the presidential election, yeah. breaks all sorts of taboos in terms of endorsing Donald Trump and so on and so forth. But he actually tries to center himself in a conversation that kind of brings folks from the black community and Trump supporters to the table while at the same time reinventing himself. And he already had Jesus walks years ago, but reinventing himself as kind of a, 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 a Christian uh, hip hop mm -hmm. artist himself um, yeah. with with the most recent album and trying to sort of popularize um, the message of the church in a way that all these things taken together kind of gave you something to love and hate about him no matter who you were. Yeah, conservative saying this dude isn't really conservative. You had black people saying this dude isn't really taken up for black people. You had Christians saying this guy isn't really a Christian. Uh, you had all sorts of folks saying that Kanye West was either selling out uh, or that he was, you know, uh, on, on the cutting edge. But one way or the other, he brought currents together, the same currents we've been talking about mm -hmm. here, right yeah. in the middle of the public eye in a way that I think a lot of people still aren't sure whether it's good or bad, 
but it happened. And so yeah. what, do we, what do we have to learn from, from Kanye West? This is a whole episode, my friend. This, John. We like, may this, just have to use this as just to preview our next conversation. Actually, that, uh, I so. would love to further this conversation because I do think there's a whole, I say, case study that can be done around Kanye. I think the first thing that make that I think about when I come to Kanye is that I wish I had a a, a more terse statement, but it's basically <laughs> like people don't do well with polarizing personalities, especially when they're trying to be serious. And I think Kanye is such a polarizing person that it just seems like, oh, he's just bored. Here's another thing. Mm -hmm. When it may be that he may just, and it, it's not necessarily bored. He's just a creative in the sense that he, a creative with the resources is probably the worst kind of person because it's, <laughs> <laughs> they're all over the place, but they have the resources to get those things done or to do to live out their dreams. See a person like me who jumps from project to project, nobody's gonna hear about my failed projects because <laughs> I don't have the resources and the marketing to be on the world stage. But I will say this, oftentimes when I think of Kanye, even going back, and this is gonna be crazy, even going back to the slavery as a choice statement, or even going back before that, when he was like, George Bush don't, doesn't care about black people. Right. I've always felt Kanye West was the kind of person who, when you watch him, you're like, I get it, but uh, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I understand what you're trying to say, but uh. <laughs> And every time I watch an interview with Kanye, I, I walk away feeling like, man, if only he had somebody else to communicate for him. Hmm. <laughs> like I get what I think he's trying to say. Sure. Um, and so to your point, I think he there's a there's a there's a disposition there that I think is admirable. Mm -hmm. Um I do think there is a naivete because of because of he has a high view of himself and he thinks that he can do things and accomplish things outside of his expertise. Um, which I think everybody should have the confidence of Kanye because <laughs> people will get a lot of stuff done. <laughs> right. if, if we had the confidence that Kanye had, boy, I tell you, this world would be, people would do all live their dreams out. They're not saying that they would be successful, but you would live it out. Um, but I do think sometimes his heightened view of himself puts him in positions where he thinks like he has more influence and power than he has. Mm -hmm. And so, but I, I will say this. Um, I think the one thing that I admire from him that I wish a lot more specifically a lot more black people had and that I see that I saw in a lot of folks like Zora Neale Hurston and um, maybe even like Toni Morrison and people of uh, luminaries of our past is that he's brave and that he doesn't follow a particular current like if he has a conviction about something he will right. share his conviction despite if it's popular or not right. and uh, he said some things that I was like you know what I wish more people would would think like this and not just be silent because it is taboo to go against the this particular progressive thought or um, to to do this um, because it's that. And sometimes he does things just to be incendiary. You know, maybe even the support of Trump wearing a hat, trying to like remarket the Confederate flag. It's like some of the stuff Kanye like look. You know, uh, you know, or reappropriate or re um, uh, 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 yeah appropriate the the, the the Confederate flag. And so it's just, <clears throat> at the end of the day, I'm like- It's not a good one, right. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, some of these things is like, man, that's, I, I hear what you, I see what you're trying to do. But at the end of the day, there is a bravery to him that I think, um, I wish even I had, like I find myself to be brave oftentimes, but there are some times when I'm like, man, I really want to say something, but I don't know what to say and how to say it. And I think a Kanye would just say it and then figure out how to <laughs> reconcile the language later, um, which I don't think is always right. But I do think sometimes we over strategize and over and over analysis, as many people say, brings paralysis. And I think there's a there's a there's a admirable there's just something admirable about just saying what you want to say when you want to say it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, I think that to me is what I love about Kanye is just that he's going to tell you, I don't think you ever you got to wonder where you are with him or how he feels because he's going to tell you. And so, um, but I do wish there was more of the posture of trying to bring healthy conversations to the space because as much as I, as much as I don't like Trump, I don't think he's as evil as some people think he is. 
as much as I don't understand some of the Trump supporters, I don't think they're inherently evil. I think they're, you know, and I, my brother, my oldest brother was a Trump supporter. You know what I'm saying? And so, but on the same side, as much as I have problems with BLM, I don't think that BLM is some sort of, you know, uh, a terrorist organization like, so it's like, how do you begin to critique people, but also don't remove the dignity of those individuals and try your best to understand their argument. Um, I learned so much, and this is my last little quick anecdote. I, I, I spent some time in, in Africa um, and a couple places that I spent were like Nigeria specifically at um, one point in time and then in South Africa. And I remember having conversations with these, these individuals who were, you know, academics and writers and activists in Africa. And it was my first time actually hearing people chastise Obama, like black folks, mm -hmm. even though they were African. And they gave me a perspective that I had never heard, especially in America. And I was like, wow, like first, I didn't know you can, it was legal for you to criticize Obama and be black. <laughs> unless your name was Alan Keyes, but yeah. it was like, <laughs> I was like, is this possible? Like, is there like some agency that's listening to us right now? That's going to like, <laughs> but then the things that they were communicating on a global level, on a national level, it made sense. It was like, I was like, wow. Like, and it changed my perspective of how, you know, I viewed him. And then the other conversation I had was, what does it mean to be a black American from mm -hmm. the perspective of Africans? And they called me privileged. I remember yeah. having this conversation. They said, you are a privileged black man. And to any black person within the last five, six, seven years, you realize like to call a black person privileged is almost like calling them the N word because it's like, what do you mean? Like white people are privileged. I'm not privileged, you know what I'm saying? And, mm -hmm. but they broke it down to me and I realized my position in the world and the resources that I have in this palace we call America and how I can use that power and that privilege for the blessing and benefit of other people, very similar to how Jesus used his power yeah. and privilege for the blessing of other people. And so it made me start to think about people, myself and the world in a, in a very different framework. And hopefully when people like Kanye are positioning themselves or when people are viewing the Kanye's or they're viewing the Trump supporters, if you're on the left or you're viewing the BLM supporters, if you're on the right, don't remove the inherent dignity that these people have and listen and say, well, what, what about what they're saying may be helpful. There you go. Yeah. Well, there may be simple truths in life, but I think most things are much more complicated than they appear. Right. Absolutely. And maybe the church uh, and music and hip hop uh, can be part of the tools that help us get to the point to where we can have those more complex conversations um, in a way that actually makes the world progress, right? Absolutely. And allows us to become better people as a part of it. So, um, Show Baraka, you are part of that change, my friend, my brother. I very much appreciate you being on with us. I hope that we can continue this conversation uh, into another round sometime when we find, find the time. Absolutely. If I can just shout out my book one time, just one he more saw time, that go it ahead, was, show it to him. He saw that it was good, you know, and that's it. You can buy it anywhere books are so audible as well, you know, everywhere. It's leave a comment, please. <laughs> he, saw, he saw that it was good. We will put a yes. link up to that uh, in the description uh, for this video so folks won't have any problem tracking it down. Show thank Baraka. You, John. Yes, sir, man. Yes, sir. My pleasure. Show Baraka, thank you once again. And for folks uh, who appreciate the mission of Braver Angels, for folks who are willing uh, to set the stage for us to be able to bring the American people, left, right, black, white, to the table to have the conversations that need to be had for us to make this the beloved community, more perfect union, check us out. You can become a member at braverangels.org. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. We are building a house united. Until next time.